Welcome to the Inner Core. My name is Paul Rauschenbusch. I'm the Associate Dean of Religious Life in the Chapel at Princeton University. And uh, we're delighted that you are joining us today. We have a special topic, which is nature and spirituality, or religion and the outdoors. I am joined by three wonderful people who work with me at Princeton University. Uh, the first is Peter Hazerig. He is the uh, chaplain of the Princeton Presbyterians. We are fortunate to have Rabbi Julie Roth here, who is the director of Center uh, for Jewish Life, and Rick Curtis, who is the director of Outdoor Action. And we have been working together on a program called Outdoor Spirituality at Princeton. And we wanted to invite you into our conversation about this connection we feel is there between uh, the great outdoors and also the great wisdom traditions, the religious traditions of the world, and how people experience spirituality and the outdoors. So we wanted to have a conversation about that, uh, representing various perspectives on that. And so I wanted to start with you, Peter, and talk a little bit about your work both at Princeton, but then also why you come specifically to this, this conversation. Right. Well, it's interesting. As a, as a chaplain on campus, uh, outdoor pursuits uh, of any sort are really not part of the job description as such. Right. Um, a lot of what brings me to this table and to this conversation is the combination of what I do now as an ordained minister in the Presbyterian Church and what I did previously as a wilderness instructor. So my intersection comes with finding ways to be involved with students on campus. Mm. And one of those is bringing a previous set of skills that I used to the Outdoor Action Program. Mm -hmm. And as I have spent time with students on campus, uh, especially in that, uh, in that program, realizing that there is very much uh, a conversation going on uh, about their experiences in the outdoors. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's been trying to find a place for religious groups and particularly our ministry to talk about uh, the outdoors, the environment, about nature uh, in a meaningful way. So by no means is it part of what we've done in the past. This right. is a new, a new creation. I want to come back to your own experiences in this, but I wanted to just go directly to Rick. Now you are the director of Outdoor Action. Can you tell us a little bit about Outdoor Action and a little bit of how you came to this conversation? Because we, we decided to collaborate on something. And what, what was your... Well, Outdoor Action is the university's outdoor education program. So yeah. we do a big wilderness orientation program in the fall for about half the incoming freshman class. And then we do a variety of outdoor trips during the year, and all of those are led by students. Mm -hmm. So a, a lot of our focus is around the group dimension of the outdoors. Mm -hmm. So rather than being sort of very focused on sort of the skills part, we focus much more on community aspect of bringing people together with the, the outdoors and the wilderness as the venue for that mm -hmm. um, in terms of building community. So I think that's the sort of common point that Peter and I initially started talking about because it was really the, the communal aspect hmm. of what happens when you're out in the outdoors. And that's very the interesting. We started reflecting on that as a way to collaborate. It's kind of like religion, ha by definition, is a communal activity. And so is what you're trying to do, is, is a lot of uh, building skills among, among groups. Rabbi Roth, can you uh, say a little bit about where you see uh, your own work intersecting with this broader question? Sure. For the first time this year, there's an outdoor group starting at the Hillel, at the Jewish Center. I think it really was inspired by this outdoor spirituality series, which is wonderful. We see Judaism intersect with spirituality or nature twice a year on specific holidays that deal with the themes of nature. In the fall, we have a harvest holiday called Sukkot, where we actually sit outside in these open structures that have natural coverings, branches often, where you can see the stars as a, as a reminder of the time when the Israelites were wandering in the desert after they were um, released from slavery in Egypt. That's the fall holiday where we sit outside and celebrate the fall harvest. And then in the spring, just as it's turning to spring, we have a holiday called Tu Bishvat where we celebrate the mm. New Year of the Trees. And we specifically celebrate the different kinds of fruits and, and nuts and other products that are, um, that are 
our, our blessing of having trees in our lives as well as make an effort to plant trees in the land of Israel. Mm -hmm. and, and I think for, for a lot of Jews, they encounter spirituality and nature in those kind of holidays as well as if they ever go to the land of Israel and an encounter with Israel. When you're in the desert in Israel studying the Bible and studying the stories that really came about in that context, you have a sense of the connection between desert, which in Hebrew is the word midbar, which is connected to speaking language that when you're in a vast open space you have a sense of awe and a quieting down in yourself that I think can allow you to be open to spirituality in a different way. Mm -hmm. We were talking the other night with uh, Professor Gager who is a religion professor about that specific about the role of the desert in the Hebrew tradition but also in the Christian tradition we have uh, you know Jesus is basically driven out by God into the desert where he really reflects on what his earthly mission is. And so the desert provides this locus, uh, this wilderness experience uh, for revelation, for encountering of God. I want to get back to a little bit of your original, uh, what you were doing before seminary. You were a, an instructor, first a participant and then an instructor in Outward Bound, which is not lightweight right. stuff. This is basically head right. to head with nature. Right. So Leading trips everywhere from seven days to 78 days. Um, and oh. so it was an extended wilderness trekking program. Mm. Um, and part of, the, part of the interesting intersection for me, one of the reasons that this group dynamic that Rick had talked about is so important, one of the things that uh, extended time in the wilderness allows is sort of a reorienting of, of the idea of control, who is ultimately in control. Yeah. One of the spiritual aspects for me is the recognition of, of the sovereignty of God, that God is ultimately in control of our lives. Mm. And I think in our society, we, we control so much. We control how we use time. We control the temperature and the environment and hermetically seal ourselves and things. Mm. And wilderness experience allows us to step back and say, boy, we really are not in control of as much as we think we are. Mm -hmm. And ultimately we need a we need a filter or a lens to talk about then what is ultimately in control and and for me coming from the cr christian tradition we want to talk about the sovereignty of god mm -hmm. the way god speaks to us in that place and the way god cares for us and provides for us and is really the source of control rather than than it being ourselves mm -hmm. I think I appreciate that. I've also heard it explained by people of other traditions, and we were, we were um, people of the Buddhist tradition might say this kind of sense of connection. I mean, I, can you talk a little bit about your own experience? You've been, you've, you're an avid backpacker, you've, all over the United States, perhaps even broader. And I remember one time I was in, um, I was swimming in the ocean in Costa Rica, and there was this incredible sunset, and it was. Um, and I was just in the water, which is the place I feel most comfortable as a you know, swimmer all my life. And, you know, these waves crashing over me and looking up and seeing this incredible sunset. I just felt like it was like I disappeared. And I was in that very moment. And I, you know, that was for me at a moment where I could really sense, okay, this is, this is a spiritual moment. I don't know how to define it exactly, but I feel so incredibly alive. Uh, can, can, do you know, you can relate to this. And I think <clears throat> part of it in, in my personal experience is that there is, when you're in nature, this sense, you, you sort of use the word awe, you know, it, it's this sense of being very small um, that I think, and you reflected on the, the Buddhist tradition. So I think that's this combination of recognizing in the immensity of what is nature and the universe, being a very small part of that. And so part of, uh, changing our scale from where we constantly see ourselves as the most important thing in the universe to suddenly being just a, a tiny piece. Mm. There's, an, for me, a, a kind of an emptying process with that, that at the same time as I sort of empty myself of a lot of my own sort of focus on myself, allows me to hear and pay attention to all those things that are, that are around you. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I've had that experience you know, in great mountain vistas, and I've had that experience, you know, walking by myself in the Institute Woods in Princeton. Right. Um, so, to yeah. me, I think that um, one of the things we talked about with Dr. Gager the other night was this, the notion of intimacy, mm. and the, the degree to which you can have experiences where you're being intimate 
with the natural world is part of that sort of key that I think starts to open the door to those transcendent experiences and to yeah. the spiritual nature. I like that word intimacy. I've heard you use it before. Rabbi Roth, we are, you know, we're all waxing eloquent about nature. We love nature. Um, now, at the same time, um, do we have control over nature according to the biblical story? You know, God gave us control over nature. You know, I'm leading you into this question because I think that part of the, a lot of the, the juice around um, environmental issues right now are actually coming from religious people who are recognizing that it's not a, um, that it's a part of our, what we believe is to, is to work um, somehow to preserve these opportunities for experiences. So w have you been involved in those kind of uh, reflections about the role of religion? In yeah, it happens that this week we're starting over in the cycle of reading five books of Moses. We'll be reading the story in Genesis of the creation of the world. Uh -huh. And it's from that story that we have this idea that mankind, humankind, is responsible or has dominion over the animals and the earth. And I think there was a time when that sense of dominion was used as a justification for using those resources only to um, to, hu to serve, serve human needs. And it's not so clear from the original text that that's the intention of what dominion means. I think dominion is also um, having a sense of responsibility, that if you have stewardship over this incredible creation that, that, that God gave as a gift, then uh, that carries tremendous responsibility. In the Jewish tradition, we talk about that both in terms of not wasting resources and in terms of not destroying natural areas that, um, that are there uh, kind of independent from being resources. They're just to be enjoyed. They're mm. just to invoke in us a sense of radical amazement. Mm. You were saying that uh, for some people, even uh, kashrut was being redefined. I, I, that, I mean, I, that may be a little bit more on the fringe. But. Well, there, there are def there's definitely a, a left-wing movement in Judaism that's embracing an idea of eco-kashrut and saying when we think about eating in a way that's intentional, that's holy, that has, has respect um, for the origin of our food, we should think not only about whether or not we are cooking meat in the milk of its mother, but also about how that chicken was raised, um, what kinds of hormones are used uh, in, in, in the animals, and, 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 and whether pesticides were used in the growing of the food. So there are some who are choosing a modern eco root, which embraces um, organic food, for example, and there are others who are saying, in addition to the traditional ideas of what um, keeping these Jewish dietary laws involve, we should add an understanding based on the needs of the planet and um, and, and, and the suffering of the animals that are potentially involved with our food sources. Mm. What, one of the things that was interesting when we were talking about the, uh, the sukkah was this idea that the sukkah should be um, weak enough that it will be destroyed if a big uh, storm comes through. And I've got to say that, you know, we all say, ah, oh, nature, you know, isn't nature nice? You know, <laughs> isn't it pretty? And then you're out in nature and you can be really like, I could... I, I could die. I mean, look at Katrina. I mean, yeah. look at look at these things. So, I wonder, like, have have any of you reflected on um, this? I don't want to call it a shadow side, it, but it's a part of nature that we is not domesticated. I I kind of feel. Like, I live in a we have in a seaside town in, in Massachusetts. People put up these big boulders. Uh, protect my pretty house. Protect my pretty house. And you think that's just gone? If like the sea decides to take that house, it's gone. You can't not do it. You know. And I just kind of feel like there's this effort of taming nature. And I, do any of you know what I mean by that? And is yeah. there a spiritual lesson there um, uh, that, that we can learn? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what you're describing is this Western romantic ideal of nature and wilderness as being the, the beautiful sunset, the, the gorgeous view, uh, the beautiful day, and yet the biblical understanding of wilderness, uh, wilderness was set apart from land. That was the distinction. You have land and wilderness. Land being the cultivated, manicured place that provides whatever, the harvest, things of that. And wilderness was some place that was barren. It does not produce fruit. Mm. And so in the midst of the wilderness, it's a very harsh environment. Mm. And while, yes, there is those moments of sunset and, and beautiful experience, there is a combination of awe and terror mm. that go along with that. And so 
part of uh, the wilderness experience for me, um, I think uh, Mark Twain talks about it, uh, about wilderness, and he says, I do it chiefly because it's difficult. Mm. And there's something to be learned from the challenge of that experience. Hmm. So much of our lives, again, if it's all in control, what happens when something doesn't go the way we had planned? The wilderness allows us the opportunity to experience the challenges that come with unpredictable weather and saying, how do I deal with it? Mm -hmm. How do I sustain myself when things don't go the way I planned? Right. And, For where, instance, and like, where is God in that? That's the other question that right. we want to ask. Right. And how do we, and how do we uh, grow? I, I was thinking about the OA five days of pure rain where right. people were soggy the first night and it only got worse. So what were some of the lessons? I mean, not only, not only theologically, but also on the individual lesson. How do you, how do you survive that? And, and is that a way to measure spiritual growth? Well, I think there's, there's the, the essence of personal challenge and dealing with that. But I think what Peter was talking about is, um, and I was thinking about this the other night, nature is, and, and that's the sentence itself. Mm. Um, you know, it is both quiet and tranquil full of, uh, at times, and it is also powerful and destructive. Um, it is, it's a force in itself that's much you know, more powerful than we are as, as individuals. And I think that's one of the places where you, where it connects back into the notion of spirituality. Because God is, you know, and that's it. You know, mm. it's not something that you can either explain in words or, or describe. And so I think that's one of those places where nature and the notion of God come together. Hmm. Um, because both are things that are beyond the scope of um, people to either really effectively describe or in any way to sort of control. Hmm. Um, so I think that's that's a, would be part of the way I'd sort of respond to your question. Hmm. Interesting, Julie. Any thoughts about that? Of like the uh, the awesomeness of God or the uh, trying to uh, tr trying to have a sense of control in those situations. I have two thoughts. One is that in Hebrew, the word yira is the, both the word for fear and the word for awe. Mm -hmm. There are two sides of the same coin in that sense. And I think that tragedies like Hurricane Katrina raise for us theological questions. If God created the world um, and set nature into motion, then in what way is God responsible or not responsible when innocent lives are lost in such a tragedy? And I think that especially after Hurricane Katrina, um, in the Jewish community at least, people were really struggling with that question. And, and from my perspective, even if you understand God somehow to be creator of the world, I don't think that means that, that God is causing a certain natural event to happen at a certain time, but rather nature has been in a sense set into motion. And I think that the reality of life is that there is always good and bad. There's a duality there. And uh, the question is, is, is not so much how do we control what happens to us, but what do we do uh, when we're faced with difficult circumstances mm. and how do we make spiritual meaning even when difficult things happen to us. In the midst of life, we are in death, and so what do we do about it? And I think nature really does confront us with that in a, in a way. Now, did you... I'm just curious, going back, there was, a, just, a, just so you know, three years ago, I think we had an outdoor action trip that had rain from start yes. to finish. It was like, just horrible. I, you know, and, and people were really, you know, by the end of it, were like, get me out of here. I mean, were there any, was there any, um, can you see any benefit to that? It, it, just to, to kind of, uh, can you see anything that people came out with? Well, you know, I think there, there are lots of people, when you talk to them about that experience, who will say, you know, I wouldn't go on another trip, but I'm glad that I was there. Mm -hmm. That the uh, back to the notion of the community, you know, the friendships that they made, the community that they, that they developed, even in the midst of the hardships that they went through together, brought them together even more. So you know, we, I heard lots of people say, "No, that's my last outdoor action trip," but I I also heard people say, "I'm, I'm glad I did it." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would never wish to. To duplicate that, however, there was a value for me at the time, and there is, and I think there is a takeaway. I had a, an experience of of seeing one of my outward bound students years after at a at a reunion uh, event, 
And I said, you know, what do you, what do you remember? I mean, obviously you're here, so it, it had some impact for you because, you know, you wanted to come and reconnect. And he said, you know, you remember the week that it rained as if, you know, I've been on a lot <laughs> of trips, but he says, you remember the week that it rained, right? And he said, rain doesn't bother me so much anymore. Mm. And here was a kid who was covered in mud for seven days, you know, he was sleeping in it. Mm. And he says, now it just, it doesn't, it doesn't look the same to me anymore because I lived through that. Yeah. And, and I think there was sort of a spiritual awakening for him during that. He said, you know, look at all of this that I'm, I've never been exposed to before. And okay, it's not comfortable, but I'm living through this. And, and I met these, these people that helped me through that process. And, and no, I'm not dead. And, you know, <laughs> and now I have not only these great stories, but this very important memory of what that community meant to him at that time. Right, faced with fear. The other thing that c comes up is simplicity, is like how mm -hmm. much, you know, how much do we really need in this world? And I think being outdoors, uh, one, as an entertainment value, is very simple. You're just walking, you know, and you don't need your, doo -doo 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 -doo, you know, you don't need all these different things that we, uh, that we feel like are, I have to have. Uh, and so there's something about removing ourselves and giving ourselves that opportunity that is just literally down at the park. I mean, we talk about, you know, these peak experiences, I have to go to the Grand Canyon, I can't just, but we, you know, almost any, even in, you know, I, I, I spend a lot of time in New York City, and even in, you know, even in the small park and down the way, I can watch, a, I can look at a tree. Um, it's a, it's a, it, it's not exactly the same thing, but there's, there's something real there that grows, that I'm not responsible for, that allows a simplicity. Um, I'm curious, though. For and this is this is like a you know advise the viewer moment. Now, can can any of you think of one way that you do this is which is reconnecting with nature and in some ways having that be a spiritual experience? Can you uh, what 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 are some of the techniques? Well, and advise the interviewer, advise Paul. Uh, what what are some of the ways that you do that in your own lives? So, do you have uh, practices that you use, or um, what are some of the things you do? I think I think I have. Well, sort of two things that go together that are that are very simple. That it doesn't matter where you live, but given that we live in Princeton and especially this time of year in the fall, uh, I have made the conscious choice that I can drive to work. I do have a spot in the parking garage, mm. but I choose to walk. And just just walking in the seasons, whether it's snowing or raining or a gorgeous sunny fall day, spending 20 minutes walking allows me to be in contact with mm. what is the season like? Uh, what is what is the day-to-day -day change in the weather? And, and it just gives me a time to adjust between home and work and back again yeah. that allows uh, that allows for an appreciation of those things. And it's, right. it's simple, whether that's you walk to work or you take 20 minutes during your lunch break to walk around the, the gorgeous campus or town mm -hmm. that we live in. Um, that that's a that's a simple thing, mm -hmm. and and it's so very different depending on the time of year you do it. Mm. I would add to that that I think often we take for granted that when we walk nowadays, we're on the cell phone, we're paying attention to other uh, things, and I yeah. think that if you're outside, whether you're walking or sitting, paying attention as a spiritual practice, really not only seeing but having all of your senses engaged in what's going on is very important. And I'd also say that if you have a spiritual practice, if you have a practice of praying or any other kind of spiritual practice, take it outside sometimes. Is that allowed in Judaism? I'm curious. I mean, you know, like, you know, I, 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 you know, there's a lot of Christian churches where you can't get married in the outdoors. That's like not an official way to you're, get married. You're actually uh, supposed to get ideally married under the open sky, I mean, under a chuppah, yeah, or a right, canopy, right. but then under the open sky. And uh, there's, there's some religious practices of blessing the moon, and, and uh, certainly Jewish summer camps, you often pray outside. And I personally, uh, even in my little backyard in Princeton, like to sit outside. So you're allowed to pray outside in Judaism? You are. Just to be clear, because I don't want to, you know, get into trouble here. Okay. Uh, no, I actually, you know, I should mention that, you know, one of my, I think probably if I were to look back, one of the major ways I came to um, really being a Christian is this small chapel when I went to summer camp outdoors with the walls being um, pine trees and being, you know, just and sitting on stone. It was the first time I actually was like, oh, yeah, I get church now where I'd never gotten church in my, you know, kind of modern uh, Presbyterian church in Madison, you know, Wisconsin, where I grew up. 
Um, what do, what are some, what, what, what's an advice uh, piece do you, that you have for, as someone who's really our resident expert, well, both of you are, but, uh, but really the... I think, what I, well, I think there are two things I can suggest. One is time, that um, I think it takes a certain amount of time to shed the thoughts, the anxieties, and everything else. So, you know, I'll go, again, over to the, I've spent thousands of hours just walking in the Institute Woods. And part of it is, it takes me, you know, an hour and a half to settle myself down enough mm. that I'm actually sort of paying mm. attention and, and being more aware of what's happening. So part is sort of trying to give yourself the time. And I think mm. the other piece is that it can often be very small thing. Um, I know I, I took a course years ago um, on tracking from Tom Brown School, and one of the things that they said was, draw a one foot by one foot plot on the ground and just spend an hour looking at what's in that. You know, the little insects that are crawling around, the plants that are there, and come back and look at it over a period of weeks and see what's changing. So again, you know, it can be the grand vistas of the Grand Canyon, but it can also be this little tiny, I mean, nature is in that same little mm. tiny plot. You know, all the same sort of miracles are happening right there as in the huge expanse. Oh, that's so interesting, Rick. It reminds me of this story. I, I, I'm forgetting the name of this uh, woman, a, a Christian woman who was imprisoned by the Nazis, and she said all she saw of nature was this little ant. But she describes this ant as so beautiful and so profoundly, beautifully, perfectly made. And it was like, it's an ant. But if you're, you know, if you're not allowed to see other pieces of nature, it's a profound uh, encounter. And that's mm -hmm. so beautiful. So. I want to thank you, Rick and Rabbi Roth and uh, Reverend Hazel, uh, uh, Hazel Ray, well, I couldn't call it, the drives, I, I gave everybody else titles. You're a director, <laughs> Director Rick, I'll call you. Uh, and I want to thank you for joining us today on The Inner Core, talking about uh, nature and uh, spirituality and, and religion and how that uh, intersects with the outdoor world. And I, and I hope you'll take an advantage of of the outdoors, go out there, um, uh, feel connected, feel awe, feel even fear simultaneously, but get out of yourself and, uh, and allow this uh, wondrous, this connection to infuse you and, and lift you up today. Uh, so again, we're glad that you joined us. Um, again, my name is Paul Rauschenbusch, uh, Associate Dean of Religious Life in the Chapel at Princeton University. Have a great day.